So I'm Ben Zorn, and this is joint work uh, with uh, Peruj Ratanawaraban from Kata Sart University in Thailand uh, and Ben Lifshitz at Microsoft Research in Redmond. Um, let me say a few things about myself first since I'm new to Velocity. Um, so I'm a, I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. I've been there about 11 years. Uh, before that, I was a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I got my PhD at Berkeley in 1989, which uh, puts me, uh, you know, dates me quite a bit here. Um, the group I'm in is called the RISE Group, Research and Software Engineering, and it's, it's a group of about 30 developers and researchers inside Microsoft Research uh, that works on a number of areas related to software engineering and programming languages and uh, contributes to different Microsoft products in various ways. So for example, in the new release of Visual Studio, there's a, a feature in C Sharp called Code Contracts, and that was uh, uh, implemented and uh, it's sort of uh, designed uh, in, the, in the RISE group. Um, other work that we've done in the RISE group include a static ver driver verifier, which is a, uh, a way to check uh, drivers automatically for various properties. And uh, if you follow the MSDN Channel 9, you might be aware of Pelly's blog. Pelly is a member of the group, and he, he, he does a video blog of a number of the uh, projects inside our group, inside RISE, um, and they're very popular. Um, so I, I encourage you to go look up his blog. OK, so let me get back to the, the, the focus of the talk, which is on measuring JavaScript. And the high-level question is, why do we care about measuring JavaScript? In particular, why do we care about how it behaves? Um, and the focus of this talk is going to be really on the client side. We're going to be talking about how to make the performance of these web applications on the client better. Um, of course, it doesn't, I don't have to really sell this to an audience like this, because you all understand why JavaScript is important, why uh, you know, this, these web applications are so important. Let me say a little bit about why you should care. So there's different people that might get, take something out of this talk. Um, if you're a user of a web application, then the, the, the goal of this talk is to help improve the performance of these web applications, uh, in particular by uh, driving uh, browser developers, i.e., uh, I mean, JavaScript engine developers, into building faster JavaScript engines. If you're a web application developer, I'm going to show you a number of metrics that we've been collecting uh, with respect to various web applications that help us understand what's going on, what the behavior is. And finally, if you're a JavaScript engine developer, which is a much smaller subset, obviously, um, hopefully there's some insights here about how to make your JavaScript engine faster. So let me say a little bit about um, you know, the importance of uh, measuring JavaScript. Of course, we need, to, we need to compare browsers. And one of the strategies that people use to compare browsers, especially the JavaScript part of browsers, is to use benchmarks. And so for example, here we see, uh, and you can find these on the web anywhere you look. I'm sure they were talked about in the previous session. Um, various comparisons of browsers using the SunSpider benchmark. Uh, SunSpider is you know, widely used. It's, it's very easy to use. Uh, it, it has a number of different elements, a number of different tests that it does. And uh, this is used as a basis for browser uh, design, browser implementation, and browser marketing. Um, what we did in this, in this project was to ask, our, ask the question, how representative are these benchmarks compared to real web applications? In particular, the, we looked at uh, the SunSpider programs, not all of them, because there's quite a number. So we picked a representative sa uh, sample of the SunSpider programs. Uh, we also looked at the V8 benchmark, which is available uh, from Google. And we compared those, those, the behavior of those benchmarks against the behavior of these top websites that we're all familiar with, things like Bing, Google, Gmail, uh, et cetera. The goal, then, is to basically understand what these, what these various applications are doing from the point of view of the programming language, the JavaScript part of the system, uh, compare how the benchmarks are behaving against how the real applications are behaving, and from that comparison understand uh, you know, in what ways these benchmarks might be misleading the people who are building JavaScript engines. Okay? And in the process of doing this, we're also going to understand a little bit about how web applications behave, and there might, you might see some surprising results. With a, with a crowd like this, you know, you're, you're very performance oriented, very, you're very used to the tools, you might not be as surprised as some other crowds. Uh, on, a, on a side note, I want to say another thing, which is that a, a number of my colleagues, especially academic colleagues, will say, well, isn't JavaScript just like Java? You know, you know, so isn't the behavior of JavaScript the same as Java? And um, I can say definitively no from the results I'm going to present here. So one of the things you can tell your friends if they, if they say they're the same is, yeah, we have some results that say otherwise. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to measure JavaScript. And we did it by instrumenting IE. Um, so we started with the source code for IE. And we modified the JavaScript engine in IE. It happens to be a bytecode interpreter. So it's actually straightforward to do things like count the number of bytecodes executed. So we looked at the code that was being loaded. We looked at the bytecodes executed. We measured a number of aspects. And one of the caveats I have to say with this talk is that 
we're measuring IE. And so in some of the metrics that we use are not necessarily going to be directly compa uh, comparable to the behavior of JavaScript in other engines, like in Firefox or Chrome. However, we tried in our efforts uh, with this paper and this work to, um, to minimize the differences. So you know, we count bytecodes, and we believe that a bytecode count is a fairly good representative a metric of the, of the amount of work, CPU work, that's being done by these applications. So we, met, we do a, a, an instrumentation of, of uh, jscript.dll, then we install it in a normal uh, version of IE8, uh, we visit these websites, and we collect trace files. So trace files basically contain information about what happened during the, during the, uh, the execution. And then with those trace files, we do offline analysis to figure out various metrics. So one of the things that we can get with this strategy is to, is to visit real sites. But beyond that, we can also look at things uh, other than, say, page load time. A lot of, a lot of metrics around browsers are, are based on how long it takes to bring up that first, that first screen. And uh, arguably, especially with more complex JavaScript applications, you really don't, you, I mean, you care how fast it loads, but you also care as you're using it what happens. You know, does the working set grow? Um, it, you know, does it get slower and slower as you use it more and more? And, and so one of our goals here was to actually have behaviors, interactions with these websites that were actually more representative of what a user will do. So for example, in Facebook, we don't just visit, you know, we, we actually log in, visit some pages, browse through photos, et cetera. Um, for for the, uh, the search engines, we go to, we look up New York City, and then we looked at some news articles uh, related to New York City, and then we looked at some uh, pictures related to New York City. So we did kind of a session that a normal user might do. And we tried to, we tried to do the same action. So for example, in the mapping applications, we used the same behavior with the same user interaction for both of those when we, when we collected our measurements. So the, the, the body of this talk, and if you're not interested in numbers, I, you know, I apologize. Um, the body of this talk is going to be numbers. It's going to be results. So I've told you our instrumentation methodology. I've told you the basic strategy that we're going to take. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you our results. I'm going to talk about what we concluded, what we measured, and, and how it sort of how it, uh, you know, what it means, or try to understand what it means. So to do that, we basically looked at three different aspects of JavaScript execution. We looked at how the code executed, so what was happening with code. Uh, uh, then we looked at the data. We looked at the data side of things, the objects are being allocated, how they're being used. And finally, we looked, because JavaScript is largely an event-based uh, programming model, we looked at the events and how the in real user interactions with these websites, the uh, events are being fired. So when we talk about code behavior, we have to look at things like how big are functions. I mean, this is taking a view of a JavaScript engine developer, someone who wants to make this stuff run fast. You have to look and say, well, what are the, what are the metrics that are important? Well, things like how big are the functions? How many instructions are executed when we call a function? Um, how, how much locality? How many functions do I use are my hot functions that I use a lot? And, and what kind of operations are these uh, programs doing? Okay. So this is the first of many charts that are going to look uh, quite similar uh, in, their, in their layout. So let me walk through exactly what this shows. So on the, on the y-axis, I mean on the x-axis, we have three groupings. We've got the, the real websites, uh, the 11 ones I showed before. We've got seven V8 benchmarks and eight SunSpider benchmarks. On the y-axis in this case, we're looking at the amount of, of uh, uh, bytes of JavaScript uh, that are being used in these, in these uh, websites during the interaction session that we, uh, that we, uh, that we did. Um, so in particular here, we see a very strong difference between the real websites and the, and the uh, benchmarks. And so uh, one of the first obvious takeaways here is uh, real websites have orders of magnitude more code than the benchmarks. And in fact, uh, you know, making these benchmarks run fast is great, except for the fact that doing a lot of work on a small amount of code might be exactly the wrong strategy when you've got over two megabytes of code, which is what we see in several of these uh, real applications. I think. Is it Gmail? One of, uh, Gmail is probably our biggest one here in this case. Um, of course, many of these applications are going to load code as you go, and we can, I'll show you that later. Um, but the reality of it is that you know, there's a lot of code there when you're actually using not a huge number of the features. Now, you might say, well, you know, maybe these string, tag cloud, and early, those look like pretty good. You know, they're bigger than the rest. You know, they're almost as big as, say, Google. Um, but, but if we look at a different view here, which is the static unique functions executed, now we're, now we're not counting any of the other stuff in that source file. We're actually looking at the actual functions executed. We see that, again, the difference is huge, and, and, those, and those outliers in the, in the benchmarks are actually mostly data. So even though they look like they have a lot of stuff in them, it's almost all data. And so the takeaway here is, yes, these functions are a lot bigger. If you want to understand how JavaScript performs, look at bigger, bigger programs. So the next question we asked is, and this is an important question for, for JIT compilation, 
is how many bytecodes get executed per call? So if there's a lot of bytecodes per call, you probably have a loop in your function, which means that doing an optimization on that loop is going to give you a big win because you can amortize the cost of jitting the, uh, jitting the function uh, with basically uh, you know, the fact that you're going to execute it a million times. So here we're looking at the number of bytecodes per call for the different applications. And we see, for the most part, we have about 50 bytecodes on the real websites. So for the most part in these websites, we're getting in and out of those, uh, those uh, functions very fast. It's more of an object-oriented style in the sense that we don't have large procedures. We don't have a lot of loops in those procedures, uh, which is quite unlike, again, several of these, these uh, benchmarks. In particular, there's compute-intensive benchmarks like crypto, which has a huge number of bytecodes per call, um, similarly with nBody, et cetera. So again, if you get a really good result on crypto, it may not tell you that much about uh, these actual websites. And in fact, you know, one could argue um, optimizing those loops is not necessarily going to give you really any benefit or maybe no benefit. Now, there is one outlier here that I want to talk about, which is it looks like The Economist is looking like it does execute uh, some pretty heavy-duty loops. And that, that caught our attention, so we drilled down a little bit. And it turns out about 80, 80 to 90 percent total execution time in in the economist is in this one function. Um, and it's basically, if you look at the while loop, it's iterating over all the elements in the DOM. Okay? And it does this on a frequent basis. So um, uh, I don't want to say anything really bad. Are there any developers from the economist here? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say anything bad about, about this code. But I think uh, one of the things that we, you can walk away from this is you know, uh, sometimes developers do things maybe in, the, in a less than optimal way. And, and maybe it is a really good idea to optimize this piece of code and make it as fast as possible. But um, we see that many of these, uh, these are you know, very, very uh, heavily engineered websites. For the most part, um, you don't see these kind of loops. And that's because the developers know that putting something like that in is going to cause some issues with the user. Um, another important takeaway here, you know, and it's related to the fact that we have a, a large amount of code, is the amount of code that actually ever gets executed. So we measured, in this case, uh, you know, what, what code was executed at least once uh, in these different benchmarks. It's, you know, it's a pretty high percentage, about 80 to 90 to 100 percent even. Um, but in the real websites, again, one of the important takeaways is uh, even though you download two, meg two megabytes of code, you rarely execute more than half. In fact, in this case, there's only one that gets that past one half. Um, and that means you've got a lot of cold code just sitting there. Uh, you know, you've downloaded it, potentially you've parsed it. If you're aggressive, you might have actually jitted it. And all that work is for nothing, because in this particular session, you're never going to execute it even once. And so this is an important takeaway, because if you build your JavaScript engine uh, uh, to be aggressive like that, you have to worry about the fact that there's so much cold code. Another dimension of code execution that developers care about is uh, how hot the code is. So in this case, we're showing the, uh, just the V8 benchmarks against the real sites. And on the y-axis, we're, we're sorting the functions by the, the, the most, the hottest, the most, uh, the functions with the most execution first, and accumulating uh, in these lines the total amount of execution that those functions account for. So for example, in, uh, in the real sites, if you look at here where it crosses the 80% line, we're, we're saying that the top 150 functions in Gmail account for 80% of the total execution. So this is telling you, you know, what, what the 80-20 rule is. And, our, and what we can take away here is that in the, in the real websites, 100 to 150 functions typically account for 80% of execution. So it's a pretty, they're pretty hot. In some cases, in the case of Google Maps, it's, it's even hotter. Um, but in the case of the, the benchmarks, again, we see uh, most of the execution is under, under 10 functions. So you really have only a tiny number of functions that are doing all the work in these, in these programs. Now, uh, the takeaway here is really about caching, is how, ma how many functions do you jit? How, many, how big is your, is your code cache? to cover these kind of cases. And I guess uh, one, of the important, uh, uh, one of the nice things in this case for JavaScript engine developers is that uh, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to handle huge amounts of code in terms of the hot code. In fact, you could take a, you could take a progressive strategy like is done often in Java, where you reject the really hot functions with higher op levels of optimization. OK, so I'm going to change gears now, and I'm going to look at object allocation behavior. So in this case, we're not worried about the code. We're actually worried about the heat. We're looking at what data gets allocated, uh, how long it lives, um, you know, what, the, what the heap consists of over time. And just like we did with the, uh, the, the CPU, we can look at sort of gross metrics. So in this case, we're looking at total bytes allocated. And uh, the, the real sites allocate, it looks like, and this is megabytes, uh, this is thousands of bytes. So the, the real sites allocate between, say, 5 and 15 megabytes in, in the session that we, that we interacted with them. So not a lot of allocation, but 
you know, it's a, it's a relatively short session. Um, some of the benchmarks are uh, so, uh, quite allocation intensive. Splay in this case. Um, unfortunately, with Splay, there's a problem in that Splay never, never releases any of the objects it allocates. So if you, if you use Splay as a way to, uh, to benchmark your garbage collector, for example, um, you're going to have some problems because your garbage collector is, uh, is not going to be able to find any garbage. Um, but, but the other takeaway here is that the, many of the benchmarks have almost no object allocation. Okay? I mean, it's, it's really literally in the you know, tens of kilobytes or, or, or less. And in that case, what, what are these benchmarks going to tell you about your implementation of memory management? You know, basically, what you would conclude from all these is that the garbage collector doesn't matter at all. You should just turn it off, or you should, you know, it, it would go a lot faster if you didn't have any garbage collection. Um, so, so then you have to say, well, let's look at the ones that do some allocation and try to figure out what goes on with them, um, which I will do in the next slide. So let's break down what's going on in the heap by the type. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, the, the type is going to determine exactly uh, how you organize your heap, how you organize the layout of objects. And what we've shown here is, again, the different groups of, of uh, programs. And we're showing on the y-axis the, the fraction of the heap uh, by type. So in particular, there are four types uh, that account for a large fraction of the, of the heap in all these cases. Um, and when we see objects, what we, what, the thing you should take away from that is in JavaScript, uh, everything, well, let's see, uh, what the way, uh, the, the, you don't think of types, uh, uh, let me, uh, in JavaScript, uh, you have prototypes. And so basically, this object category counts uh, the instances of all objects, basically. Um, so we have objects, which represent all the different classes that you would have in, say, a Java program, string, arrays, and script functions. And those four account for a huge fraction of the, the total allocation in most of the websites. Now let's step back and say, well, of these benchmarks, right, most of, most of these benchmarks are really not very interesting because they don't allocate any data. So let's drill down a little bit and look at the ones that do allocate data. And uh, what we find here is that they're, they're very unrepresentative of the actual programs. So in particular, RegExpert and the String Tag Cloud basically allocate only strings. They, you know, there's no, there's no uh, arrays, there's no functions, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, array trace is almost all objects. So basically, um, it's a, good, it's a good benchmark if, if you think there are a lot of objects in real websites. But in fact, the reality is if you look at the real websites, the code, which is uh, the script functions in this case, the, the data allocated script functions, accounts for a significant fraction of the heap in all cases. And we'll see that in some of the other uh, results I show. And then strings account for the rest. So almost all of the data in the JavaScript heap are strings and functions. And again, if you're, al if you're, if you're thinking in Java terms, you're saying, well, everything in Java is an object. I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to do a really good job garbage collecting those objects. But for these, for these websites at least, that would not give you much of a benefit. Um, I've been told that there are some web websites that are very object heavy, and I will not deny that. But I think uh, it is it's also important to realize that there are many that aren't, and that JavaScript is being used largely as a glue language. So it's not doing a lot of computation, as we saw actually in the previous result. And mostly what it is doing is putting together strings. And that's, what, that's why you're seeing a significant fraction of allocation in strings. OK, so I just mentioned that. Um, yeah. So we can also take a different view, which is looking at the, the, con the contents of the heap over time. Okay? And uh, in this case, I've zeroed in on just the four types that we talked about in the previous slide. Um, and this is logical time. And we measure in allocated bytes. So you can measure in different ways. But basically, every time stuff gets allocated, we increment the, the, uh, the time forward in this case. Um, so this shows the contribution of each of these different data types to the heap. And uh, when, it, when one of these lines, like in this case, the strings drops down, it means that uh, those, objects were, were, you know, those objects of that type were actually uh, garbage collected. And so in fact, uh, the garbage collection of a particular data type reduces the size of the heap, uh, the, its contribution to the heap. Um, OK, so what does this show? Well, first thing we see is that strings get garbage collected. So strings are short-lived, which you know, makes sense. They're being used for temporary results. And after you, create, after you generate the result, you don't need the string anymore. What's kind of surprising here, well, of course, and then another thing you see here is that functions increase over time. And that makes sense. Most functions, you, know, you, you allocate them, and you don't throw them away. You just, you know, they just sit there until the program finishes. Um, there are some function closures that you might reclaim. But in, in particular, you see some of that here. But for the most part, uh, it's all uh, functions that live forever. Um, but what is surprising in Gmail in this case is that the objects it allocates actually live for a long time as well. So in fact, the objects and the, fun and the functions have a very similar lifetime behavior, which is completely different than you would expect to see, say, in Java. 
Um, so this is a view of the heap, which gives you a sense, yeah, what, what do I need to optimize for here? Uh, you know, and uh, maybe the, my, my um, belief about object lifetimes is actually not what it would be in, say, a language like Java. <clears throat> so we can also look at a different website. And this, in this case, we're looking at eBay, the same view, um, and we get a very different story. And this is actually an important story because it shows us, again, that Java and JavaScript are very different. So in this case, uh, we see over time, uh, the, you know, the, the heap, especially the heap uh, devoted to functions increases, but then we see it drop down to zero, and this happens frequently. And that's because we, we're looking at an entire session, a user session in eBay. We're not just looking at the page load. And as a user uh, crosses a, a page boundary, loads another page, the JavaScript uh, sort of uh, uh, virtual, uh, uh, virtual environment gets thrown away, and we recreate another one from scratch on a new page. Okay? And it turns out we do that frequently in this particular session. Um, one of the takeaways here, uh, actually, yeah, I mentioned that. One of the takeaways here is that uh, when we create these heaps and then discard them, oftentimes we're going to create a heap that looks almost identical to the one we just threw away. And so an important takeaway here is if we want to make this perform well, one of the strategies is going to be to cache the previous version of things. And in fact, you can do that with functions, which we're seeing evidence that Chrome does now. Um, uh, and you can imagine actually caching more than the functions. You can imagine caching the entire state of the heap on the, on the, likely, on the likely event that the, the, the page you go to is going to look a lot like the page you just came from, which is the case in, in this case in eBay. And we see this in, in the full paper. I should put it in a plug. So we have a tech report uh, that has a lot of these results um, for all the different websites I showed. Uh, it's about 50 pages long. Uh, but uh, I encourage you, I'll, I'll show you the URL at the end, I encourage you to go visit that if you're interested in seeing these results specifically. Okay, so these, these figures g uh, give us another picture about how uh, our websites are architected. So in this particular case, we're looking at Bing, and this is Google. This is about a year ago, so they may be quite different now. They, they're a moving target. Um, uh, and what we're showing is the live heap over time, and uh, basically in Bing, what we see is we see a lot of code gets accumulated, a lot of garbage collection of the strings, et cetera. But it's only one page visit. We never do a reload in this entire session with Bing. So basically, Bing, you, you visit that page, it brings in stuff, you never reload the environment. And it, so it accumulates a lot of functions, you know, significant number of functions over that period. But by the time the session's over, you have a lot of functionality that's, all, that's, that's right there. Okay? Google has a very different strategy for, uh, for the same set of uh, search queries, essentially. Um, it's, it, as you can see, it's, it's highly tuned to make the footprint extremely small. The idea is that you know, small footprint, very responsive, and that's what, that's what they want to engineer for. And as you can see here again, uh, I guess this is uh, three image searches or three, three drills downs on images. Um, you see a very similar behavior in that we, we get a page reload that basically rebuilds the same heap over again. And, uh, so I think the takeaway here is that if you're implementing a JavaScript engine, um, you need to account for both of these. These are both very, very successful websites. The people who built them are engineers. They know what they're doing in terms of building it for performance, and they have different goals in mind. But both of these are equally good in some sense uh, in, the, in that uh, you know, they're likely to be uh, you know, used, the strategies, implementation strategies. And so uh, uh, you know, both of these are different. They're totally different than the benchmarks. OK. So next thing I want to talk about is event handling. And uh, events are very important in JavaScript. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the sad things about the benchmarks is that uh, the benchmarks really don't stress this at all. Um, of course, and I won't go into this in detail, I mean, is JavaScript single-threaded? Uh, uh, many of the user interactions are handled with event handlers. Um, use, user responsiveness is very important in these websites because you know, if you take a long time, you know, this, the whole purpose of this conference is to make it so when somebody clicks on something, it, it happens instantly, okay? And so what you want to do is optimize for this kind of behavior. The people who write these websites do optimize for that behavior. Unfortunately, the benchmarks don't. And so this is the total events handled um, in real sites and in V8. Um, uh, SunSpider is identical to V8. Um, so you see on the order of uh, you know, hundreds, 500 to over 6,000 events, okay, in the course of a relatively simple session. Um, Amazon has thousands of events firing, and in fact, uh, Many of the events, as I'll show in a minute, many of the events don't do much at all. Um, so again, you know, there's all kinds of things going on in the background 
Uh, but, but the most important takeaway here is that when you, when, you, when you handle that event, it better be really fast, because if it takes a long time, your user's going to notice. This is a median byte codes per event handle, and you can see there's a, quite a wide variance. Um, uh, things like the mapping functions uh, usually uh, probably are taking more time because they're doing more work. We saw a talk earlier about Google Maps and, and the effort that, that they put into handling things asynchronously. Um, but for the most part, the, des the developers here are trying to optimize the median event handling time to be very short because they know that if they have a loop in there, you know, and, it, and it's, in the, it's in the UI thread, essentially it's gonna, it, people are going to notice. Um, so, so that's it for the numbers. Uh, if, I, if I've worn you down, I, I apologize. Um, I tried to make the case that the benchmarks, yeah, I got it. I, I tried to make a case that the benchmarks are very different than real websites and that the differences are, are significant enough that if you, if you optimize for one, you may, not, you may not get the right result in the other. Um, and, and maybe you'll say, well, sure, of course, you know, we knew that, or you know, benchmarks are always a problem, right? What can we do? Um, so we asked a question uh, in, the, in the course of doing this research, which was, well, so how much of a difference do some of these things make? And we, we, uh, we created this cold code experiment. Um, uh, it's, it's a very simple experiment. And uh, the, the underlying perspective is we saw the real websites had megabytes of code, much of which never gets touched. So the, the simple question was, what if we add cold code to SunSpider? OK, so we've got this very tiny program. And we just add a megabyte or two of code to that tiny program. And that's the only change. So we, you, know, you never execute that cold code. It's just sitting there. How much difference does it make on the results? It's a very simple question. And this is what we did. We looked at two, two browsers, IE and Chrome, IE8 and Chrome. Um, and we added between two megabyte, uh, zero and, and two megabytes of cold code to these, uh, to these benchmarks. Um, so each grouping is, you know, uh, as the progressive effect of adding more and more cold code on the SunSpider result. And of course, uh, you can see it has an effect. Well, it's, it's natural that it's going to have an effect because despite everything else, you, ha you know, the browser, the, ha the, the JavaScript engine has to deal with all that code. So it has to read it in, parse it, or whatever. So there's going to be some fixed overhead. What's surprising in this case is that the, uh, that the overhead can be significant. So in this case, uh, with two megabytes, a 3D ray trace, I think, is uh, four, four and a half times slower uh, than it was without that cold code. Um, another thing that's surprising is the, is the amount of non-uniformity that adding more and more code has. So in this case, for example, in IE, we add, you know, we add one megabyte, we get a certain amount of impact. Actually, we add like 200K, we get almost no impact. But if we add two megabytes, we get a much bigger impact. So one of the high-level questions is, well, what, you know, if you had enough of this cold code, does it push the JIT compiler, does it, it push various aspects of the, the JavaScript implementation into a different mode, which makes it much slower. Um, and so uh, the perspective here isn't you know, that uh, you can see IE you know, on these benchmarks, even with cold code, is a lot slower than Chrome. Um, this is IE8. Uh, the perspective isn't you know, one browser is faster than the other. The high level takeaway here is uh, you know, if we're comparing browser performance based on uh, SunSpider benchmarks, which is more representative? Is it the browser performance without the cold code, or is it browser performance with the cold code? And based on our results about real websites, I think I would argue that the results with the cold code are actually more representative. Now, that begs the question, can we do better? And of course, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll address that in a few minutes. <clears throat> OK, so let me just iterate, reiterate you know, the impact of the benchmarks. If you look at SunSpider and you want to make those run fast, what do you do? You're going to do things like make tight loops run really fast, which you know, all, all the browser manufacturers have done. Um, you, uh, you look for optimizing small amounts of code. Maybe you don't worry as much about the cost of jitting. And you, have to, you really have to worry about that in a real website. Um, other issues which these benchmarks don't expose at all, like garbage collection, are, uh, uh, would be ignored if you didn't take into account these real websites. Um, dealing with all that code, dealing with events, having large number of events, some of which execute for almost no time. Um, and you know, even things as broad as this issue about well, what is a real web application experience? It isn't just uh, running one piece of JavaScript. It's actually a sequence of page loads that represent a, a useful user in interaction. Things like buying something on an on a, uh, a, a e e-commerce site or you know, looking something up on maps. And so you really do have to think about the full picture and not just look at uh, you know, what one benchmark would, would, uh, would show. OK, so in conclusion, I, I talked about JSMeter, which is an instrumentation framework that we've used to do these measurements. 
I've talked about the differences between real websites and the benchmarks. And I will just point out that these results bring us to a few different uh, sort of future things to think about. First of all, uh, you might ask, well, what about better benchmarks? And uh, we certainly are thinking about that. I'm happy to talk to you offline a little bit. We don't have any results to talk about yet. Um, but that's certainly a direction that we'd like to take this work. Uh, second, of course, some of the ideas uh, that we, or some of the results that we saw in our work uh, point to ways to make JavaScript runtimes better, especially for real websites. And finally, um, uh, some of the metrics that we exposed in a JS Meter uh, are metrics that many developers would probably find valuable, uh, specifically in terms of understanding what their, what their websites are doing uh, at the level of the JavaScript behavior. There's, there's really good tools that expose thing, you know, things like these waterfall diagrams, expose where time is being spent. But, but they don't necessarily say, for example, give you a picture of the heap or tell you, you know, that, that your heap is composed almost entirely of functions, et cetera. Okay. So in conclusion, let me just mention a few things. You can look us up on the web, JS Meter. Um, you can actually look at a, a Channel 9 interview with us uh, and Eric Meyer uh, that uh, we did about a month ago. Um, there's a paper we actually just, uh, there's two papers really. There's a 12-page paper which we published in Web Apps, which is a USENIX conference that just happened this week. Um, and that's probably the, 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 the short version. If you want all the, all the gory details, you can read our tech report, which is about 50 pages. Um, and with that, I will take questions. So, uh, we've got time for like five minutes. Or okay, so great. But uh, just so we get as much time as possible, maybe we can get uh, Philip and um, Bobby and Lindsay first in and half minutes each. If you guys could bring your laptops up. Please, please come to the microphone. So good information. Thank you. I was just curious, um, did you actually compare the performance of, of IE uh, versus the performance of the uh, other browsers on those same common 10 websites that you used as your test bed? So, so, so the whole, uh, I should make this clear. So the goal of our, our approach was not to compare browser performance. And in particular, we instrumented IE. So I mean, in terms, of the, in terms of the behavior measurements that we made, we can only get those numbers from IE. Um, you know, we'd love to see people put the same metrics into Chrome or Firefox, and we could, we could do some, you know, I mean, one thing we asked was, well, how representative are these numbers across the browsers? And we, we don't have complete evidence of that. We, we tried some things to try to make sure that they were, they, they're, they're honest numbers. Um, but, you know, but, you know, ideally you would have this kind of information from any browser. Sure. Another question? Yeah. Would you come to the mic? I was just wondering if you had any idea, what was the 50% of the cold code? Was it just widgets in the corner that nobody ever clicks? Or is yeah. it like error handling that never happens? So we didn't drill down on that. I mean, I think, I think both cases. A lot of times there are features that will be loaded that aren't used. So that's not uncommon at all. Um, this work that Ben Lifshitz has done, Delodo, basically is, a, um, is an uh, attempt to uh, lazily load code. So basically you wouldn't even see the code that w was a feature you didn't use. Mm -hmm. um, I think. So I think that's a large part of it. I think one thing to point out is that uh, these kind of websites have a tail of developers. So you know, the, the top websites will have really strong developers you know, really, really working on performance. And as you get to you know, websites that don't have as many uh, uh, people visiting them, you probably have people that don't have as strong skills in terms of building uh, high performance websites. And so one question as, a, as a, an engine developer, you have to ask, well, you know, what are you optimizing for? Are, are the sites where people just throw things in there and, you know, and get it working and not, don't worry about performance? I think there's probably a significant number of sites like that. Um, we certainly saw that with, you know, with the, the Economist, for example. Um, so it's probably not uncommon at all. With regard to your, your, the, the comment that you made about instrumentation and the fact that you built IE and that you can only get values for yourself, don't you think that Matt might suggest that it would be behoove the industry to actually make a common API or a method to extract that instrumentation performance benchmark, irregardless of competition, so that those can be measured on equal footing? 
Well, certainly I think it's a good idea to have strong performance tools in all the browsers to help you understand what's going on. And I think we see that. I, you know, some of the talks today basically showed that uh, people are building cross-browser cross tools. Um, how much of the instrumentation of the performance tool has to be in the engine instead of outside the engine is an interesting question. And whether or not um, we can get the, the main players in the space to agree on an API that everyone can use. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think anyone will disagree that more information for developers is better. Um, it's just a question of priorities and, and negotiating it, yeah. I, I didn't mean it as an attack. Oh, no, no, I, 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 no. Please. Thank you. Um, quite a good talk, um, quite good background information, but I have a dummy question uh, as uh -huh. a web developer. It, I, I, so I immediately thought of things, what I would do if, if I would be a browser developer, but when I'm a web developer, do you have so number one tip what I should do better? As an application developer? Um, hmm. I think, well, so, hmm. so first of all, I guess the high level takeaway would be Look for tools that give you this kind of information about what's going on. Um, certainly, for example, the cold code, right? If you had a way to say, on a typical user session, this code never gets touched, right? Then that would tell you, you know, I should, I should figure out a way to not download that code. Never, never, you know, never use it. Um, so that's one of the things that Deloto, this work that I mentioned by Ben Lifshitz, does is give you tools to help you do the separation. But one of the high-level questions a developer might ask is, well, where is that code? Why is it not being used, et cetera? I mean, you could, you could do the same thing with analytics. You could say, look, if there's a feature in there that nobody ever uses, why the heck is it in there, right? Or, you know, maybe we should just pull it, right? So those are the kind of questions. I mean, that's, that's the code side. I would say on the data side, um, we've seen this too. There are some cases where you see hundreds of data objects, thousands of data objects, okay? And again, it's, that might be something doing animation and it really needs to, to allocate all those data objects. But it also could be just a bad, a, a bad developer who, who didn't realize that they could just allocate one and not have to allocate one every time they, did it, they were in a loop, for example. So I think you know, views of, of the data, views of the code, actually even the number of events, right? How many events happened? And, and you know, what, what was the average duration of event? I mean, that's, that's a very useful metric. You know, I don't, honestly don't know if there are tools out there that will tell you this now. But clearly, as a, as a website developer, I care about what the user experience is, and I want to know the 95th percentile on the pause time of a user level event, right? So those are, those are all possible things. Um, I'm not saying that you, know, you can go out and get them right away, but I think that these are things that would help developers. Okay, great.